special guest for today, the Blue Man drummer, Anthony, and I don't know how to pronounce your That's last not, name. It's all right, Rashika. Rashika. Yes, sir. How do you spell Rashika? R I S C I C A. Do you know how to spell Mississippi? Uh, M I S S I S S I P P I. I've never had a spelling bee <laughs> in any of the interviews, but that's that's really good. Um, tell us a little bit about your rock and roll biography. Um, I started playing drums. My my father's a drummer. I started playing drums really early early on there in my house, so I was kind of self taught at the mm. beginning. Um, and then I started taking lessons when I was like a late teenager. But before that, I, I was already, already playing. I grew up in New Jersey, but I was already coming into play places like Kenny's Castaways and with people from my town, mostly older kids. Um, and I got hooked on playing music then, like just out in a club playing music. Um, and then I went to school for music. I studied jazz, so that was a, a bit of a different scene, not, not, not like the rock, but I continued to play rock and roll also. I just fell in love with it really early on, and it was a, it was a passion of mine. I couldn't let go. Well, I think musicians who learn other other genres that's not their favorite, mm. it makes you a better musician. And I think jazz um, jazz can help with any learning how to play any style of music. It's kind of like swinging a baseball bat with a weight on it and then taking the weight off. It's like, oh, I learned how to do all this stuff. Now I can back it up a little bit. Kind of. I, I shouldn't say that as a complete idea, but for a lot of people, learning jazz can really help with it any other style. Well, Anthony, a lot of the drummers that I know that have become friends of mine over the years, mm -hmm. like Carmine Apiece, yep. or um, let me think who else, uh, Vinny, his brother, yep. Vinny Apice, Carmine Apiece. <laughs> what a family. Um, gosh, the guy from Bad Company, why can't I remember his name? Oh, gosh. I don't um, think I ever knew his name, but I love Simon him. Kirk. Yeah. Simon Kirk. Okay, I did know his name. Um, Bill Ward from um, Black Sabbath. And Ringo Starr, you know, uh, I'll just put Ringo on the side for a second because I don't think it's part of this conversation, but I've talked to them and each one of them has said at one point that jazz was part of their whole upbringing, mm -hmm. you know. John Paul Jones, another one who just plays oh, yeah. the bass, another one who learned to play the bass. His dad gave him a ukulele and he tuned it to be a bass. So that's cool. Ah, that. Right? Ah. He's also a great piano player. Yeah, too. he is. Great, great all on the keys. All the Mellotron keys. stuff. Yeah, all the um, Mellotrons. I mean... Um, a person your age, you probably have never seen a Mellotron, have you? I have seen a Mellotron. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, explain to somebody who's listening, tuning in for the very first time, what a Mellotron is. Uh, a Mellotron was basically like the first sampling keyboard. It was analog, so you could record, let's say, um, some strings onto the tape. And then when you pressed the key, the different keys, it would play that tape at a different speed uh -huh. so that you can, you could basically take in one analog sound on this piece of tape and then transfer it to each one of these different notes. That's right. So you could create, I mean, yeah, the, the, the flute sounds at the beginning of Stairway to Heaven, that's a Mellotron. Uh -huh. Um, well, Beatles used it all the time. Oh, you, yeah. you, you know this. Ringo actually used it on uh, Ringo Rama when he produced that with um, Mark Hudson. Mm -hmm. I asked him, where'd you find a working Mellotron? It was one in the neighborhood. Well, now, now they make now they make new kind of like I think they're they're like digital versions of it. Uh like, well, you know that doesn't really count. Yeah. I mean, the the Lumberson gigantic Mellotron. Yeah, uh, primarily a, t a tape machine with a keyboard attached to it. Uh, run off of air, I believe. Right? I think that it was, I'm not sure. air would force through it too. It was like a really interesting. That's possible. Piece of machinery. Yeah. Musical machinery. Yeah. All right, so you, you learned how to play the drums. Your dad now, did your dad end up doing that for a professional kind of thing? He did for a long time. He um, went to Manhattan School of Music, then he did club dates for a long time, back in the 80s, like early 80s, um, through the 90s, uh, until he got replaced by DJs. But um, yeah, he, he did that. I used, to, I used to carry his drums for him sometimes. Oh, he's also a band uh, director at a high school, and... Um, kind of went along that route to, he just retired a few years ago, but oh. he became a uh, superintendent of high school. Oh, cool. I think that uh, some of the most entertainment, entertaining musical things that I've ever witnessed are third and fourth graders trying to play <laughs> in a band, and all you hear is just one note. And there I am laughing. My wife's hitting me like, stop laughing at the kids. You're going to make them self kind of like, no, this is gold. I just like this kind of stuff. I would rather see these kids play and go and yeah. see what happens than buy a ticket to go to most shows some, in Madison just, Square. So right. you end up as a member of uh, the Blue Men. Mm -hmm. Blue Man. Blue Man? Blue Man Group. Blue yeah. Man Group. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and we're all aware of the Blue Man Group. It's got to be sort of, uh, I don't know. I, I, how does it feel to 
only be recognized when you're all blue. Well, here's the thing. I am not all blue. I'm not one of the blue men. I am the drummer in the show, so I'm glow in the dark. I, the dark. I have UV oh, paint. I have UV, UV tribal paint on my face. Oh, great! And a UV outfit, and uh, so we're completely visible to the audience when when we play, which is the, there's music. I would say in about sixty percent of the sixty percent of the show. So we're up in this loft, and black lights light up, and all of a sudden we're these glowing characters that are kind oh, of that's kind maniacal, of cool. shamanistic. Okay, there's there's different things we could talk about, and we only have so much time. And I really am interested about the Blue Man Group and your drumming and uh, your your growing up. What, what part of New Jersey did you grow up in? Teaneck. Teaneck. Okay. Yeah. Oh, not far from where I live. Bergen County. Yeah, yeah I live in Oregon. Oh yeah. Do do you live in Teaneck now, or are you in New York? No, I'm in Long Island City. Long Island I've been City. There. I've been oh. there for 14 years. Yeah, uh, on the cusp of Astoria. Uh, I'm actually more south, so I'm like on the cusp of Greenpoint. Oh, Greenpoint. Right over the Pulaski Bridge. Yeah. You know what? There's a place in Greenpoint. I don't know where it is, but the next time you're in the neighborhood, would you pick me up a jar of Basic, B-A-C-I-K, Basic Pickles. It's chili pickles yeah. without the brine. Yeah, I believe I know. You, yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this guy. Yeah. So we're going to have you come back on a weekly basis, bringing in the Basic Pickles. <laughs> what was your favorite radio station? What did you like to listen to? Um, Z100, I uh -huh. guess first, like when I was much younger. Forget what the rate, what the rock. It wasn't Q104.3. No, it was 1027 WNW. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's Scott right. Muni in the afternoon. I would listen to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I listened to a whole like a, 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 I would always had a very eclectic taste in music. I, I think the first two two CDs uh, I ever got, my parents bought me for Christmas and. One of them was Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style, and <laughs> the other one was John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman. See, that's a very interesting mix. Uh, wow. And yeah, it kind of grew from there. And then rock and rolls, I mean, Zeppelin and, and uh, Rage Against the Machine was a huge one. And I would come home from school and throw on a CD. I mean, I loved it. That was like my favorite thing to do. I'd come home from school, throw on a CD, and try and play along. So now take us, how did you end up in Blue Man Group? Uh, I actually auditioned uh, to be a blue man a uh, long time ago. <laughs> so you wanted to be an actual blue man? I, okay, I don't want to... I don't want to uh, offend anybody, but I didn't. I hadn't seen the show. I'd never seen the show. I had a friend of mine who was a drummer who was playing in the show, and um, at that time, if you recommended somebody, and they got the part as the blue man, you would get this this bonus or the stipend. And so uh, he said, "You're the right height. You're a drummer. Come in." And so I made it through a few, few rounds of the audition. I had a few callbacks, um, but that was the first time I saw the show, and, and I watched it from up in the loft, which is where I play now. And so I'm standing behind my friend and watching what the blue men are doing and watching what my friend is doing. I was like, I don't want to do that, pointing at the blue men. I want to do that, what my friend was doing. So it turns out I didn't get the gig. Uh, a few years later, I'm playing uh, with a friend of mine and he invited his guitar player friend to come. Uh, we're playing at this wine bar, just doing like this improvisational stuff. And he invited uh, his friend who happened to be the full-time string player, zither player, the electric zither, which is a crazy yeah. instrument. Um, and he said they're having auditions for the drum set. Uh, if you want, email this guy. And so I went through that process, like open call, for like 80 people or something like that. And um, I got it. That's the way I got it. Call back, a few callbacks, callbacks. And then I waited for a while and they had me in for one last audition. And then I got I got the gig. That's great. So now what's uh, what are you looking forward to do now? What do you want to do? Um, well, I recently uh, became a music therapist. I graduated. I have a, a, a master's degree in music therapy. That's great. Yeah. that's. See, now, I'm sorry, but that trumps anything you could do in life as far as I'd rather be a music therapist and help people like that than even be John Bonham. Okay. Well, John Bonham's dead, so that's not good. <laughs> good ending to that story. But seriously, that it's is nice one of that. That, that. That is one of the most beautiful things that you can do. Thank you. It helps so many different people. To me, like, you just like... You wrote, you 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 went to the number one of my favorite drummer of all time list, <laughs> just by saying. So yeah, that. I, that's yeah. what I, that's what I pretty much do full time. I'm still at Blue Man. I do that I do that part time, but that's the new thing. So I got you know I graduated. I got certified as a music therapist, and I've been working full time since uh, se September doing that. As a music therapist, mm -hmm. is somebody who might be tuning in? Yep. What what is that? What do you do as a music so, therapist? So music therapist, uh, let's compare it to say music lessons where you're working with somebody and the goal is to have uh, them uh, learn the instrument and become the best as, that they can at playing the instrument and uh, as knowledgeable about music as they can be. When you're working in music therapy, you're still working with music, but the goals aren't musical anymore. So I work with um, some at-risk kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so the goals with, with with them is 
uh, more social and emotional support. Right. Um, but you're using music to do it, whether they were playing in a drum circle together or we're making tracks on GarageBand or Logic or something like that. Um, I work a lot with uh, children and adults on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, with, I mean, there's a, a great phrase about that. If you've met one child or one person with autism, you've met one child with autism. So every, all, they're all unique. Yes. It's, you know, every, everybody's unique, obviously, but you're dealing with different uh, cognitive um, le you know, levels of cognitive functioning and that kind of stuff. So the, each each client that I have uh, on the spectrum is a different thing. But in that in that realm, you're working a lot on um, just being able to be there with with somebody else, somebody that doesn't have the. Uh, I work a lot with with nonverbal uh, clients, and with them, it's about connecting and allowing them a way to communicate with somebody else that and that they're not usually capable of um, because they don't have the language. But if you can link up with them and start to play a drum with them, you can see, I mean, a lot of times you see their eyes light up and they're like, oh, like they feel heard and they feel like they are, they're communicating. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, I can't, I can't speak to how they feel, but it, to me, it feels as though there's a communication happening between me well, and me. Well, yeah, I, I think that you're probably use, you're in, it's an intuitive kind of thing. You yeah. get it. They, you both get each other in a nonverbal way. Uh, I would imagine that a, a person that's on the spectrum, when they pick up that drumstick and they start making noise, yeah. it's beautiful music to their ears, and they feel like they're they're creating something. Yeah. And and that, that that's a a great way to feel a, a sense of purpose and value because now you're creating something. And then they look at your reaction. You're like giving a, a smile on their face. They're like, I'm doing it right. Right. Because so many times. I would imagine that a person that's on the spectrum or might be severely disabled, maybe nonverbal, people really, uh, they just tune them out or they step over them, mm -hmm. you know, maybe emotionally or just, they just like ignore, right? Yeah. Go on passing. Like so many homeless people that you see. Mm -hmm. We all know that we can't feed everybody and we can't take care of everybody, but you can say hello to everybody. Right. You can go, uh, how you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, simple things like that. And or if somebody comes up to you and they start speaking to you, just listen to what they have to say. If they go, I need money for food and you don't have it, just go, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I wish I had it. I just don't. Right. You know. Um, but if you're here tomorrow, I'll bring you something. Right. Or, you know, there's there's always a way to figure out the problem. Right. Just taking a little time. But the the nonverbal kid on the spectrum, um, without giving any names away. Mm -hmm. Can't. You, well, I, it's HIPAA. I yeah. understand that. So, what was the your first experience with a child that's on the spectrum, and you the very first time you started doing the music therapy with that person, or or maybe tell us a time where you you really felt like, oh my gosh, what a breakthrough. Okay, I have a, I have a good one. So I was working part of my internship um, in my second year of school was working at a school for autism out in Brooklyn. And um, he wasn't completely nonverbal. He had a few, he had a few words, um, but I'm in, I was in a session. He's very energetic. I would say he's 10 years old, very energetic, very energetic, like to climb on things to the point where we had to have two, I, me and the woman who was my supervisor had to run the session together so that one person could be playing the music and the other person could be facilitating the session or following him around, making sure that he wasn't, doing anything dangerous and trying to bring him into the music, offering him a drum, things like that. Things that you can't do from from behind a guitar. So she's playing guitar and I was I was facilitating that session with him. And he, he had basically, we were in this kind of smallish room that we did music therapy in, and he kind of had backed her into a corner. She's playing, she's playing, and he kept saying dance. So she's trying different things on the guitar and he puts his hand on, he keeps putting his hand on the guitar strings and says dance. And we're talking about intuition before, and it's intuitive moment. I, in my head, I said beatboxing, and then I was like, ah, no. And then I was like, wait a minute, why not? So I started beatboxing, and he immediately spun around. What is that? Beatboxing. Oh, cool. All right. So immediately spun around, made strong eye contact with me, and came <laughs> shooting over at me and started dancing. So, oh man. So, so here's an example of. Uh, uh, he has that word dance and he wants to dance and he's, he's asking he's basically asking for give me something to dance to yeah and 
you know, please don't play Pink Floyd. A guitar, a guitar by itself. <laughs> let's be honest, it's not. It, it can make people move for sure, but it's that the, there's no, you know, bass and drums make really what create a dance, a dancing feeling, and so um, I think that that's what that's what he needed. That's the input that he needed, which wow. like we all do. I mean, who wants? It's hard to dance to a, a strumming guitar. I would agree with that. Um, yeah. But when you, if you, if you, all you got to do is if you make a beat with your mouth, you can make a beat with a drum or a drum set. I use a lot too. Um, then you can connect with him. We connected that way. And the that's eye contact, great. man, I, I can still see it in my head. He spun around and just looked straight at me and I was like, okay, that's is it. This is what he wanted. Are you still in contact with that person? Uh, no, because I don't work at that school anymore. Oh, okay. It was just for my internship. Yeah, I, I, that must be a hard thing for you. It, yeah, it's not like um, yeah, moving away from clients or um, ending ending uh, therapy is is tough for for both of us. For everybody, yeah. but I would say that don't worry about it because someday, some way, you'll meet again, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. So it, it was really nice that you stopped over. Thanks. I want to have you back, mm -hmm. and I want to want to do a series about music therapy. Sure. And I want to talk about these interactions I would love and, to do that. and put a spotlight on it and then maybe bring some other musicians and music therapists with you absolutely so that we could um you know, talk about this and then maybe one day down the road we'll all sit in a room the different music therapists and different musicians and we'll do one of those crazy little music videos that you see on uh, jimmy fallon yeah, when he does yeah, that they're all yeah and, and so maybe part of your mission will be because I can sing. I'm a really good singer. Okay, cool. Right, Patrick? <laughs> yes. I'm a really good singer, but as it went, no? Ah, oh, you jerk. Uh, but when it comes to playing an instrument, mm -hmm. I was never able to really accomplish that. Wait, I played trumpet until I broke my face. Voice is an instrument. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's like cooler to be able to get, hey, look at me. Maybe I can play the gazoo. All right, there's, there's an option. But maybe we can do a really special song and then use that to raise some money and awareness so that we can put more money into music therapy and help more people I would love through that. music. Broadcasting from the Rock and Roll Bomb Shelter. I'm ready. I wanna rock! Surrounded by radioactive biscuits and the world famous Rock Eyes. Located 40 feet beneath the radio station. It's the Big Fat American Rock Show. With your host, the Doc of Rock, the Professor. Everyone's favorite mad music magician, crazy uncle, and your best friend in the whole wide world, Zach Martin.